morning all. Uh, confession time, it's really good to be in a place of corporate worship. Um, Steph and I have chosen for our own health reasons and stuff to do the whole online church thing like most of us have since March. Uh, and man, just to stand in corporate worship uh, is so refreshing. And you start to understand a little bit more of, of why uh, the fellowship of the saints is so critical to our spiritual growth and development. Um, anxiety uh, is not anything new to most of us. I entitled this message, Fixing Freaking Out, um, because for a lot of folks, we're freaking out. Yeah. And we've been freaking out for quite a few months now, and we've had lots of reasons to freak out. And uh, I kind of want you to, to, to start this conversation by thinking about um, all of those triggers, all of the things that have caused us to freak out. Um, in the same way that we are actually thinking about one of the primary catalysts that have gotten us to freak out, this whole COVID thing, whether you call her Rona, whether you call her whatever, yeah, I don't care. But one of the reports that came out just last week or two weeks ago that caused such a stir was that um, COVID has this interesting little habit of piggybacking onto other illnesses that we have, right? That's why the, the people that are most susceptible to it are folks that have pre-existing conditions, heart conditions, lung conditions, all that kind of good stuff. I need you to be able to think about during this conversation that anxiety about COVID and all its related junk actually does the same thing. It hijacks where we're at in our mental health and well-being. It hijacks other areas of susceptibility that we have, places that we were already anxious, places that we were already depressed, and it hijacks it because it just turns up the flame. And I want you to be able to think about that as we go through our conversation. I thought it would be really interesting. Uh, first, um, I'm not your traditional speaker up here. So if you want to, I know, I, I never had homiletics and hermeneutics and all that kind of stuff in school. Um, so I know that I'm supposed to, to start with something funny. So I, I want to give you advice uh, for living in 2020 to reduce your anxiety. If you're dreaming, and in your dream you come across the toilet, whatever you do, don't use it. Some of you will take longer to catch up and figure that one out. If, if You can't even tell if the person has a confused look on their face next to you to explain it to them. This is horrible. Ask someone later what he meant by that joke, okay? Um, we get confused, and, and the church has had a historically contentious relationship with psychology. Um, and so I thought I would clear some things up and help you understand that you have some incredibly real practical tools to address what's going on in your heart and mind. Amen. You have some incredibly practical tools. And I want to show you, I want to juxtapose what God says to do with your anxiety with what psychology says to do with your anxiety, okay? And we're going to compare and contrast them today so that you get to pick and, and choose which tools are going to work really well for you, all right? But I also want you to recognize that um, God's plan that he puts together is like a recipe, okay? And there are ingredients that have to be in the recipe. How many of you know, now some of you are really sick, so you're going to answer this incorrectly, but how many of you know if you're, baking, if you're making cookies homemade, that if you leave out the flour, all you get is this sugary, buttery junk that some of you are sick and like to lick, and yeah, it's a, but, but most of us, yeah, you got to put in the flour, right? And of course, if you forget something like the salt or the baking soda or the sugar, it's not going to taste right, okay? In the same way, if you leave 
some of these ingredients out in the way that you address your mental health, in the way that you address anxiety, you're going to have results that are, are less than fruitful. Um, and you're going to be frustrated with it. Because you're going to say, God, I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And God's going to try and whisper back to you while you're yelling, yeah, you forgot the flower. There's a reason why it's not substantive to your heart right now. So as we go through this, consider all of these kind of like critical ingredients, okay? All of us have seen this one you've been in church for any length of time. In Philippians, Paul writes, don't be anxious about anything. Now, for a lot of us, we're like, okay, is, is he like taking drugs or something, or is he under some kind of, what, what's going on here? How, how in the world does Paul tell us as human beings something that feels like it's just a natural part of our existence? Uh, don't do that. Don't have that, right? It, it's it, it's antithetical. It doesn't make any sense for Paul to say, don't be anxious in anything. Why? Because we have so many things that cause anxiety, right? But Paul, it's really cool if you read a lot and do your digging, he usually doesn't tell you to do something without a way to do it, okay? So I want us to consider everything that Paul has told us in this section of Scripture. Do not be anxious about anything, but with thanksgiving in every situation by prayer and petition, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So, what's the cost of anxiety? Well, God's Word and psychology pretty much says the same thing, okay? Because according to God, worry and anxiety choke out the Word. That, that's straight out of Mark. It chokes the Word, making it unfruitful. And what do we know the Word to be? Well, the, the Bible, right? And how do we drink that Kool-Aid? Well, we read it, right? So how in the world would it choke out the Word? It would literally make it to where it didn't make it applicable to you. When it chokes out the Word, you read it and you go... I've read that before. I get it, but I don't get it. It's not really applicable to me. That doesn't work for me, Brian, right? Well, there's a reason. Anxiety actually makes the word unfruitful. Another cost that God tells us about is that it weighs down a person's heart. But a good word makes it glad. When I read that, in Proverbs, I think of the fact that anxiety has an evil twin sister in the world of mental health. It's depression, right? If you look through the symptoms lists, um, they overlap a lot. And when I read that in Proverbs, when it says, hey, guess what? This weighs your heart down. I think of depression and all of its symptoms that come along with experiencing anxiety. And, and I'd like to point out that as much as you hate anxiety, if we don't take steps to eradicate it, then we're actually welcoming it through our inaction. Finally, God tells us that a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body, but jealousy, which by the way is a manifestation of insecurity and anxiety, is like a cancer in the bones. There's uh, plenty of evidence in the world of psychology and in the medical field that tells us um, the physical symptoms of anxiety are exactly like a cancer. In fact, there's evidence to suggest that you can take out the word like. 
Meaning what? Meaning some of your mental health stuff could actually create the petri dish in which cancer grows? Uh Uh-huh. So we need to think big. We, We need to think beyond just, it's hard to get out of bed and my body aches a little bit. We need to think about the fact that we welcome something inadvertently into our lives that can kill us, not just make us have a bad day. But psychology tells us that the cost of anxiety are distorted thinking patterns and inability to see life correctly. If you sit in my office for any length of time, I have habits like any other counselor. And one of my habits, and I've actually told people this in chapel before, one of my habits is to use a lot of metaphors and analogies. And one of my favorites is to actually take my glasses off And if I do, I'm going to jack up this mic, so I'm not going to do it right now. But I take my glasses off, and I hold it out, and I let people look through the lenses. And i got to tell you, I can see fairly well, but my lenses would not testify to that because I have a horrible astigmatism. I mean, like, way off the charts astigmatism, which means I could take my glasses off and still see pretty well, but you wouldn't know that from looking through these lenses. And I use that as this this wonderful picture of what our thinking looks like when we're under the influence of something, when our subjective reality takes over our thinking and we're no longer objective. Psychology tells us about that comorbid depression. For a lot of us, what that looks like is analysis paralysis. We're like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. And left unchecked over time, We start to consider each action and dismiss it as something that'll work. Right? Well, do you want to go get some ice cream? No, I'll just get fatter. Well, do you you want to go play? You want to go throw a frisbee? No, it's hot. I don't. Do you want to go do this? No, I don't like doing that anymore. There's actually a clinical name for this. It's called anhedonia, and it basically means you've lost the ability to have pleasure in anything. Doesn't that sound horrible? Now, why am I setting you up? Because that's what this is, by the way. It's a setup to be able to tell you, hey, guys, this is the cost. If you want to avoid all this junk, if you want to avoid cancer of your soul, if you want to avoid not finding pleasure in anything, and some of you know what I'm talking about because you're already there, then I really need you to pay attention to to the ingredients in this recipe I'm about to share, okay? Step one, or the first thing in this recipe. Whoa, I went too fast. God tells us in the very next part of Scripture, Paul writes, don't be anxious in anything, but with Thanksgiving. Guess what? Psychology has picked up on that. They write books about it. They call it gratitude therapy. Isn't that something? It's like, wow, someone made a lot of money uh, about writing about something that Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago. What it does is it provides a context in which we're supposed to function, okay? It prepares our hearts This idea of thanksgiving prepares us. So how do we do it in our spiritual lives? Well, I grew up listening to uh, a song on counting blessings. The old fogies in here know it. uh, And it just said, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. And some of you are singing it in your head, right, Greg? Yeah, okay. Okay. Counting the blessings is something that was preached. Counting the blessings, gratitude, thankfulness, was something that was emphasized. Why? It combats anxiety. It provides a context in which you're going to function. Now, obviously, for Paul, he says, and it's connected to another ingredient. But before we get to that other ingredient... 
What else does it do? It checks our heart before we get into the temple. It makes sure that our attitude is right. In therapy, in the world of psychology, um, we call some of this grounding. Um, And you've probably seen it. I've seen memes on it even just this week. People sit in my office and they experience anxiety, even panic attacks. And they'll come back the next week after me sharing this one thing and not have panic attacks anymore. Not because I'm a magician, but because parts of this recipe really work. I'll ask them, what do you like in my office? Some people have never been in my office, so it is an awkward question. They're like, well, that's just weird. No one asks people that. It's like, yeah, I know. Just go ahead and answer the question. And they're like, I don't know. I guess I'm supposed to say you, right? <laughs> I'm like, sure, you can be thankful for me. What else? I, I, I like that picture. Okay, great. What else? Are you catching what I'm catching? It's really hard for them. It's difficult. You have to recognize that's because of a frame of mind. We're not used to being thankful. We're not used to looking around and seeing what's aesthetically pleasing to us and attributing it to God. We're not used to it. And so I'll sit there and I'll beg them, okay, come on, more, more. Do you like the the couch you're sitting on? Those of you that have been in my office know that I have a really, really nice leather couch. And it sits awesome. I, I, I truly believe, unbiased, that it's the most comfortable place to sit on campus. I think it's fantastic. Do you like the couch? Yeah, yeah, it's great. And then I go down, you know, a, a rabbit hole and say, yeah, I went to Mississippi and picked it out myself. And then I bring myself back to the conversation and I say, what else? Do you like the ambient lighting instead of this obnoxious stuff? Do you like the, the cappuccino-colored walls? Do you, what, do you like the clothes you have on? Do you like your kicks? Do you like the jeans you're wearing? What do you like? And then I say, would this be easier if we were outside? If we were walking down the sidewalk this morning, if we were walking into your room, if we were... See, we don't have the habit of functioning in our gratitude, of functioning in our thankfulness. Meaning, we don't have thankful spirits. I'm, I'm just as guilty. It's, it's too easy to get distracted with all of the things. But grounding brings you back from your distractions. Grounding brings you back from all of those wonderful little Alice's holes that you're diving into. What if this and what if this and I'm really afraid of that and grounding brings you back. And sometimes Boy, when you wrap that up in what God tells you to do and recognize that in order to be thankful, there's a target. When you recognize that God is the giver of all good things, then it really provides a context so that in a sea of good, the waves aren't so scary. The things that cause us anxiety aren't so scary when we're looking around and appreciating what's really awesome about our lived experience. And that's just starting with the physical realm. Gratitude therapy establishes objectivity. So, step number two. Maybe. If I push the right button. The verse goes on to say, we read it, by prayer and petition right? Present your request to God. Now, when I was thinking about this, um, one of the things that's always been intriguing to me is why Paul differentiated between the two, why he put two things in there. And other translations say prayer with supplication. And when you do a little, you know, look up, because I do that all the time because I'm not sure what the words mean, right? You can confess that. It's okay. I already told you I, don't, I didn't get homiletics or hermeneutics either, so, and, and most of us don't do Hebrew or Greek. Those people are weird. I love you. Supplication means with humility. 
Supplication um, means that you're going with an awareness of who you're talking to, taking your prayers and petitions. And I really think that what Paul and even the folks that were translating it into different versions later were thinking was, wow, most of the time when we take our petitions to God, we are whiny little turkeys. We are whiny little brats. We're like, oh! But we really don't come with humility and an awareness of who we're talking to. We're talking to the all-powerful God of the universe. What taking prayers and petitions to God does is acknowledge God and His power and dominion and authority over what's causing our anxiety. We're at the same time, because of our humility, acknowledging our inability to fix it or even understand it. I don't get it. I can't explain to you. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I can't explain to you why COVID hit. And thankfully, because of this, I don't need to. Right? Some of us get lost in that. Psychology piggybacks off of that idea and says, you know what? Yeah, I really do need to focus on locus of control, what I can and cannot control. You guys, most of you have been exposed to the serenity prayer. It's basically, help me, Lord, to figure out what's in my control and what's not, and give me the wisdom to know the difference between those things, right? Because that's really hard sometimes. We want to control. I, if I, I, I won't make you raise your hand, but if I asked you to raise your hand um, by showing that you're a control freak, we'd get a lot of people raising their hand. Well, you realize that's a, a susceptibility then to anxiety because you're going to try and control a whole lot more than what's yours. Good. Psychology and parts of Scripture tells us that if we take our prayers and petitions to God, it releases us from responsibilities. <laughs> Again, if I raise your hand to say, oh, is responsibility one of your top five strengths? <laughs> I, I think that would be, uh, you'd, you'd see some of the same hands go up that raised about being a control freak. Because it's actually a gift, but the shadow side of that strength, the shadow side of that gift is that you try and take on responsibility for things that aren't yours. And it just creates anxiety for you. Most of the time, in sermons I've heard, in conversations I've had, we stop there. Why? Well, because you just gave it to God, right? You just laid it at the cross. You're fine. It's not yours anymore. Problem. Most of us confess, most of us will lay it at the altar and we'll go, man, thank goodness, that's, whew, that's gone, thank goodness. And, and then we're like, thanks, Pastor, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and we put it right back in our pocket, right? What keeps us, what protects us moving on? See, that's what Paul understood about our anxieties. He understood that, yeah, it's not just in that moment when you're freaking out. It's how do I give them something that will make sure they stop freaking out moving forward? Not just when they get on their knees and give it to God, but then they turn around and go, well, what does it look like from here? If, if, I, if I'm not responsible for that, if I'm not in control of that, what does it look like from here? And thankfully, Paul gives us the flour to our cookie recipe. Whatsoever things are true, right, noble, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think on these things. You know, it's not just about getting you to have happy, happy, joy, joy. It's getting you to have happy, happy, joy, joy that stems from truth. 
not from riding a roller coaster, which I love roller coasters, <laughs> gotta confess. Cedar Point, holla, I love Cedar Point. Oh, we got a Cedar Pointer, okay, good. But this isn't about your happiness. This is about Paul telling you something that will sustain you in joy, which is different from happiness, right? Joy is about your condition. Joy is about truth and something that's much bigger truth than whether or not, you know, I get an adrenaline rush from a roller coaster. It's about the condition of your soul. It's about your condition of your relationship. He's trying to get us to focus on what promotes godly thinking, hope-filled thinking, instead of fear-based thinking. Martin Seligman, decades ago, is known for being the father of positive psychology. Um, I, I don't think he's read this part of Philippians because Paul beat him to the punch by a couple thousand years. Because positive psychology is the scientific study of what makes life worth living. Oh, wait. Uh, whatsoever things are true, right, noble, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Uh, wait. We already have the list. Right? How much did we actually have to study it? Not a lot. But what Seligman did find out in his study of the adoption of these principles is that it minimizes our pathology. It minimizes what we could be diagnosed with, meaning it minimizes our anxiety. He just basically scientifically studied the result of applying this scripture. It promotes satisfaction, happiness, confidence, and hope, but because it provides us something to focus on other than our fears. What gets put in its place? Well, Scripture is fairly clear. The release of need to know. It's beyond your understanding, right? You don't need to know. You don't need to figure it out, right? Peace that passes understanding. Drink the Kool-Aid, guys. Come on. I don't need to figure it out. Amen. Right? Which releases me from my worry and fear. It gives me a freedom to engage daily living. It gives me a freedom to trust God. Here's the biggest difference between psychology and what Paul wrote. God is not the thing that psychology wants you to trust in. Psychology hits a brick wall at the end of this because instead of trusting God, who is the all-powerful being in the universe, psychology asks you to trust yourself. Well, there's a problem because it turns right back to the very reason why you had the anxiety in the first place. Trusting yourself suggests you need to be able to have it all together. You need to not screw up. You need to not freak out. But remember, it's kind of our natural predisposition without God to freak out. In Isaiah 26, it reads, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Whether you're dabbling in the scripture or dabbling in psychology, there are steps, there's a recipe. But ultimately, what cements it all together, what causes us to be able to move forward, grow, disciple, is trust in God recognizing that he has things under control so I don't have to. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this word. 
Thank you for the way that you instructed Paul to give us a recipe to tackle our anxiety. Thank you for being so faithful and true that, God, we can see all around us the abundant blessing that you've provided to us. Thank you, God, that you are available to us and that we can go to you and that we can lay these things down at your feet. Give up responsibility. Give up control over them so that we can actually give you control of everything. Thank you for the gift that we get in return, this peace in our spirit. God, I pray that you give us the ability to put the recipe together. I pray that you give us the ability to see what's true, to see what's noble, to see what's just, of good report. God, give us the ability to stay above the fray, to be able to let anxiety not be something that we tolerate, but something we defeat. We'll give you praise and glory in your name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a great rest of your day without anxiety.